Mi ringrazio per il gentile invito, è un onore per me parlare qui oggi a Venezia. Non parlo italiano, sono americano, sono stupido, scusa me, so it's going to be in English, particularly American English from now on. So I want to talk today ab about my work in molecular biology as a historian, but also as someone who's done public policy on some very important cases in gene patenting. Uh, and also a phenomenon that's very much an American phenomenon about personal genomics companies. That if you want to know what your race is, you pay them anywhere between $49.99 to $150, and they'll tell you what your races are, which is a fascinating concept for so many different reasons. So I was a molecular biologist in a previous life. If I speak too quickly, you have to tell me. It's not a problem. I'll slow down. So, so far, so good. Il tempo perfetto. Grazie. So, io capisco la lingua musica. So, just sit there and say lento or say andante, pesto, pesto, presto. I'll get it. But other than that, my Italian's not so good as it used to be. So private sector funding in molecular biology has been an incredible gift. There's no doubt. No one would deny the importance of funding of the biotech sector by corporations and by philanthropies. Where we are in molecular biology would not, we simply wouldn't be where we are in molecular biology, particularly when you're talking about precision medicine of cancer research. But as a result of that increase in private sector funding, I think it's time that we all take a pause and rethink classic legal notions such as ownership and property. Because as a result of the increase in privatization, it turns out a number of sociologists and historians and philosophers of science have argued those concepts are highly flexible. They're rather in unstable. And as a result of that instability, there are a lot of moral implications that all of us need to be cognizant of. So there are two parts of my show today, which will not be longer than 45 minutes, I promise. One is the history of gene patenting, and the other is the rise of DNA testing companies or personal genomics companies. So it's a, a history from, you know, the recent history of molecular biology from the 1990s until basically the present. It's very much an American story, the story of the America. I know about the German story because I've spent way too many years in Berlin. Uh, I've also spoke to many patent of, uh, examiners at the European Patent Office in Munich who work on gene patents. What the situation in, it, in Italia is, boh. I mean, clearly I know you're part of the EU. Uh, but there are interesting similarities, I would have thought, in differences with Germany. So that it would be very interested to hear that in, in the questions that you have or comments that you have to this show. So the first part, gene patents. The first gene patents that were ever uh, granted date back to 1982. And one of them was for insulin. Um, later on in the 80s, the European Patent Office and the Japanese Patent Office followed suit. Talking to people at the EPO, they said, we did not want to patent genes, but because your damn Americans did, we felt that we had to patent them as well, otherwise we'd lose a lot of uh, research and development from Europe to go to the United States, where the research would have been protected, and their intellectual property would have been, would have been uh, protected. Now the first question is, how in the world is it legal to patent genes? Marco was kind enough, I, you know, I had an appointment. I, I had like four appointments, but the Medi School of Medicine the School of Law didn't pay me. So if you ever want to do this, like have multiple positions at the university, make sure the med school and the law school pays you. If you get paid by historians, sono pavaretto. So that's the moral to the story. So when I was in the law school, I would talk to law students, and they look at me and say, well, why aren't genes patentable? We have, law, we have rules about patentability. Has to be novel, has to be useful, has to be not obvious. And if anything follows those rules, it's fair game. Only Congress can say, thou shalt not patent whatever, right? So it was an interesting take for me because I thought it was absolutely insane that you could patent genes. Um, because I always thought that products of nature were not patentable. It turns out they are. Dun, 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 dun. And it's a very interesting philosophical question which is historically contingent, which is, what's the difference between natural and artificial? What is that boundary? And how does one get to get a natural product and be able to patent it? Um, and the, the corollary question is, who is the one who decides what's artificial and what's natural? And in this case, clearly it's patent examiners from the various countries. 
So the United States got together with the EP, European Patent Office, and the Japanese Patent Office, and said, you know what? If you isolate a gene from, it, from the genome, you make a cDNA copy, which is very straightforward, DNA, uh, um, uh, uh, cDNA using messenger RNA, uh, and then you put it in a cloning vector, that molecule is now artificial. It is a product of human hand, and it is now for patentable. By 2013, and that's the date where I believe the data, after that's a bit, you know, I, I'm not quite convinced, 41% of the about 22,000 human genes that we have in the genome have been patented, over two-thirds of which belong to private companies. And that raises a fascinating question about public versus private knowledge, which is also raised at the conference, which you didn't have to be at, but in order to get to, yeah, it was totally different talks, but um, which has come up. And that is, with the increase of private monies, who owns that knowledge? Patents do not give you any right except for one thing, and that is to stop someone else from doing what it is you've done or using the object that you've patented. If I patent something, I'm under no obligation legally to follow through with the patent. I can sit back and say, I don't want to do it. I'm just going to stop anyone else from doing it, right? And so it raises rather interesting questions about exclusion and notions of secrecy, because it turns out gene patents actually increase secrecy. Laboratories in the United States and throughout Europe, if they're working on a gene or any biomolecule that is going to be patented, they generally do not share the results until after the patent's been granted. Then the patent becomes public, right? That can be four to five years after, the, after they worked on it, which in molecular biology is a very long period of time. So this is a story, in a sense, about patent leniency in the biotech sector. And they got incredibly lenient because by the, say, late 1980s, you no longer had to make a cDNA copy. You no longer had to put it into a vector. You just had to isolate it. Isolation was never the bar for patentability. Indeed, the question is now, is that a product of human hand? You basically take molecular scissors, restriction endonucleases, you cut out the DNA, and then you patent it. If I take a tree from a leaf, I cannot patent that leaf. Right? As Judge Sotomayor famously said, if I have patents on chocolate chips, I don't get the patent for chocolate chip cookies. And that's going to be an important quote later on in the show. So, as I said, it's about the leniency. And when talking to patent examiners at the USPTO, they basically said, Miles, we were under the assumption in the 1980s and 1990s that if you allow patenting of genes, you're going to encourage innovation. Right. The companies that, that had this genetic information were genetic sequencing companies. They were not pharmaceutical companies. They only, had the, in a, they only had the gene information. So the argument was, if we only have the gene information, if we want to encourage investment, we got we to gotta protect that information with patenting. Right. Um, the interesting bit is they didn't talk to historians, because they never talked to historians. And we've shown that it's not always the case historically that if you give away patents that you encourage innovation. There are a number of examples where that's true, and there are a number of examples where that's simply untrue. And it turns out it's untrue when it comes to gene patenting. Gene patenting actually inhibits innovation at times, and I'll give you an example of that today. The first legal case to challenge directly gene patents happened in the United States was the American Civil Liberties Union versus Myriad Genetics, which was a, is a company in Utah. They challenged it in May of 2009. Myriad Genetics had the patents for two very famous genes, or infamous genes, for breast cancer, called BRCA1 and BRCA2. If you have a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, and you're a woman, woman you have an elevated chance of breast cancer, anywhere between 40 and 60 percent. You have a greater risk of ovarian cancer. Men with a BRCA1 or 2 gene patent have an increase in breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, so clearly an important gene medically. Myriad Genetics owned the genes. They owned the wild type sequence, which is simply the naturally occurring sequence. Um, they owned all of the mutations of the two genes, even the mutations which had not yet been discovered. You gotta love this stuff. We've got all mutations. We don't know what they all are, but we own them. How in the world do they do that? I'll talk about that just in a minute. They also had patents on the genetic tests for those mutations. So they have a rather, rather extreme monopoly on breast cancer. How do they get all of the mutations? You basically say, you put in the, in the patent application, in the specification, 
the gene sequence, and you say not only this sequence, but any sequence that's 70% similar to that original sequence. That's basically the whole damn gambit, right? It's something known as a Mercouche structure that is derived from uh, chemistry, uh, organic chemistry and the law. Um, the problem with this is that it was impossible for secondary testing, for verification. If you were a woman and you wanted to be tested for breast cancer, and you went to a doctor, say in Princeton, they would take the sample, they'd send it back to Myriad Genetics. If, you, if it turned out either positive or negative and you wanted a second opinion, say you went to Pasadena and did, a different doctor took the sample, it would still be sent to Myriad Genetics. There was no independent secondary verification, which in medicine tends to be rather important, right? Um, as a result of the fact that there was no secondary testing, there were a lot of false negatives, which means the women and men were told they did not have a mutation when in the end they did. And that's why the ACLU went after Myriad Genetics. Myriad Genetics defended their intellectual property most enviously, which is a very bourgeois way of saying they were a bunch of shitheads, right? What they did was immoral, not illegal they stopped any researcher in the world from working on those genes or inventing tests, other tests for those genes. They actually sent cease and desist letters to two colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Ganguly, who's at University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and Dr. Oster, who was at NYU. He's now at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. They basically closed down research with their patent. Because if you were a scientist and you did research using breast cancer one and two genes, they'd say, that, you know, the scientist could ask, what, how much do I have to pay to use the, this gene? Mirogenic said, you may not use this gene, regardless of how much money you're going to pay us. Because it, 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 it simply perpetuated their monopoly, which in the long run was financially beneficial to them. Right? So the ACLU came in. And the ACLU said, the ACLU specializes in First Amendment cases. I'm not a lawyer. I've never played one on TV, and I can't spell the word if you spot me two of the three letters in English. Uh, so I said, look, you, you guys do First Amendment. Don't worry. We do First Amendment. You have another homework assignment. And they said it was, a, it was an issue of civil liberties because they say, if you grant, and this was from their website, if you grant a monopoly on fundamental pieces of knowledge, it infringes on First Amendment rights, which protect the freedom of scientific inquiry and the free exchange of knowledge and ideas. I talked to a number of outstanding law, law professors at NYU. They said, we don't believe it's a First Amendment case. Right? But it turns out the ACA was very, very bright. They said it's a First Amendment case so that it would go into the courts. And they had a two-pronged attack. They said, we're going to call it a First Amendment case. It might not be that, but Miles, your homework assignment is that you have to research whether genes are patentable subject matter based on precedent cases. In the United States, law is... is precedent cases that's tantamount, right? So if you can show that precedent cases do not apply, you score a big victory among legal circles. So my homework assignment was to write a, a legal deposition for the U.S. District Court, Second District of New York. And I, was, I looked at a thing called the so-called product of nature doctrine. Because everyone says, Miles, you can't patent products of nature. And it turns out, actually, you can patent products of nature. Because historically, we've patented uh, extract from clams, which were used in perfumes, not necessarily perfumes I'd want to wear. Uh, we've patented hormones. We've patented vitamins. We've patented an antibiotics. We patented a bacterium uh, that was genetically engineered so it could uh, turn oil spills into biodegradable entities. We've patented plants. We have the Plant Patent Act of the US Congress of 1930. Not all plants, but some plants. Seeds, that's how Monsanto makes multi-billions of dollars a year. Vaccines, we've even patented a mouse, the Onco mouse. Which is, a genetic, which is a genetically engineered mouse which is um, programmed to succumb to cancer. It was patented by Harvard University and DuPont. And we've patented stem cell lines. So many people argued that we're for gene patenting. This is just the next inevitable natural step in patenting biological molecules. And as a historian, whenever you say it is natural or inevitable, lights go on saying, no, it's not. So let's look at the history, and that's what I did. The key argument, if you look at all of the precedent cases, the, the key argument 
that was that there were two cases they used. One was Diamond versus Chakrabarty, in which, which is a Supreme Court case that says a patent substance must have unique properties which have a utility. If you patent something that exists in nature and you're patenting it for something it does in nature, you may not patent it. But if you take something in nature and change it, purify it, for example, it now has a different property that's patentable because it's now a product of human hand. Now, is that the case with a patented gene? The answer is no. And what I argued, I said, look, if the patented gene had proper properties different, substantially different from the gene in the genome, surely the tests would have no efficacy. So you either give up the test patents for the tests or you give up the patents on the genes which Myriad Genetics, of course, would not do. They wanted both, right? The other homework assignment I had was to look at precedent cases in addition to Diamond v. Chakrabarty, and it turns out the obvious historical point some more is, is an important one, which is the reason why certain decisions get made historically and the reasons why they're precedent cases are often very, at times, antithetical. They're very, very different. And so the, the second most often case, uh, ca most often cited case for gene patenting was the adrenaline patent that was adjudicated by my favorite, my judge with my favorite name, Learned Hand. I'm not making that name up. He really is named that. In 1911, he famously said that uh, adrenaline, which was, a, uh, which was purified by Park Davis Pharmaceuticals, was patentable because the biochemist took naturally occurring adrenaline, purified it so many times that it now became a therapeutic agent. It was a medical agent when the naturally occurring th um, um, adrenaline was not. Because if you give naturally occurring adrenaline, it actually kills somebody, right? So his argument was, you've changed the thing enough that this merits a patent. Again, when you patent a gene, you really don't change the gene. You make a copy, cDNA copy, but that's it. So the rulings. And the greatest upset since... I don't know if Venezia ever be defeated into Milano, AC Milano. I mean, in American football, when the New York Giants defeated the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl, it'd be that equivalent, right? Judge Robert Sweet rules that we were right. Genes, in essence, are products of nature. They haven't been altered, and they're not patentable. Uh, this is the, you know, this is the, we, we were David, and they were, that's probably the best example. They were Goliath, and we won, right? We knew that the victory was going to be ephemeral because it was highly controversial. We made the New York Times. We made 60 Minutes, Easter 2010. We had our 15 nanoseconds of fame. Um, Myriad Genetics said, oh, not so fast, we're going to appeal. And they appealed to the Federal Circuit, because there are literally millions, if not billions of dollars at stake. Because if that ruling were to hold, all gene patents are off the table, not just breast cancer genes. Right? They file the, the appeal. It gets heard on, in April 2011. I, we, our team, the ACLU, gets a call. We have a conference call with then acting Solicitor General under Barack Obama, Neil Katyal. And he basically said the president is very interested in this case um, because unlike our current president, Obama could read, um, and says, look, we want to argue for a cardinal distinction between products of nature on the one hand and human-made inventions on the other. Otherwise, elements of the periodic table, like lithium, could be patented. And that might be oxygen. I hate when that happens. You just breathe today, nitrogen, oxygen, you know, you have to pay X amount of money to the company. And it was interesting because it was the first time in history a representative, an official representative of the executive branch presented an argument to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals saying, let the ruling stand. This is important. And, of course, they didn't listen. So they side with Myriad Genetics. Now, a federal circuit court in the United States, you get three judges. There's a total of 17 when it's totally filled. And Judge Alan Lurie was great. He said, well, you know what? It, genes are patentable because when you, when you patent a gene, you break covalent bonds, not ionic bonds. Therefore, it's a different substance. Now, I was in a beer garden very drunk in Germany when this ruling came down. It was about 11 o'clock, so it was 5 o'clock Washington, D.C. time. So the lawyers called me up and said, Miles, do you know Linus Pauling? I said, not personally. He's dead, but I know his work. They said, do you think this, is a, a, this argument makes sense? I said, no, it does not. The argument, what he wanted to argue was that if you take something like salt, table salt, if you break ionic bonds, you get smaller bits of salt crystal. It's still salt. Covalent bonds, you're really changing the substance. Well, it's a bit of a stretch, but interesting for the public understanding of science Alan Laurie has a PhD in chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania. 
He also was an intellectual property lawyer for Monsanto for a number of years. Eccolo, right? Judge Kimberly Moore was much more sophisticated, although hardly on the heart of the side of the angels. In her ruling, she writes, despite the literal chemical difference, the isolated full-length gene does not clearly have a new utility and appears simply to serve the same ends devised in nature, namely to act as a gene encoding a protein sequence. Well, this looks good so far until the special word, however, comes. And she writes, changing course years after the fact will only serve to punish those companies who made the reasonable decision to invest large amounts of time and money to the identification, isolation, characterization of genes. Unsettling the expectations of the biotech industry now strikes me as far more likely to impede the progress of science and useful arts than advance it. So technically you guys are right, but we're not going to mess with the economy. Interesting. That is a legal ruling, by the way. Not only because a judge said it, it actually is true. The third judge, had the, and she, by the way, had a, a master's degree, an undergrad, a BS and MS in electrical engineering from MIT. William Bryson was an English lit major and a history major, and he said, genes are products of nature and therefore not patentable. His were like four pages. It was like, I don't know what those other two are talking about. This is mirror games. It shouldn't be patented. So we lost, but it was close, right? So it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, because we appeal it. And in November 2012, they said, we're going to hear the case in spring 2013. So I was asked to co-author an amicus curiae brief with two lawyers about my views on this as a historian of science. And the interesting thing they said is that this is not a First Amendment case. We're not going to hear it as a First Amendment case. We're going to hear it on the, on the, on the plausibility of genes being patentable subject material. So you know, the heat was on, right? I mean, I couldn't choke. I was actually invited to the, to the day, no joke, it was on tax day, 2013, April 15th. And I'm, I'm very irreverent, because I don't take this shit seriously, but there's a sense in which when the nine Supreme Court justices are in front of you, I, you, know, you don't speak, right? You, know, they don't ex, you don't do expert wins, they read everything in advance. They did their homework, I have to say, they really did their homework. Uh, and they ruled 9-0, it was unanimous, go figure, that genes merely excised from the genome are not patent eligible, but if you make a cDNA copy that's a product of human hand, that is still patentable. It was a compromise. They realized that if they said, thou shalt not patent genes, they would destroy the biotech sector. They also said, rightly, it's not our job to say what's patentable or not. That's Congress's rules, right? So they put that stopgap in there. And the court, it was, the, the opinion was written by Clarence Thomas. They basically said this was not meant as a rule against patenting products of nature. So you still can patent products of nature in the United States. The key is that it must have a characteristic that is unique. You must do something to that molecule which renders it unique from the naturally occurring homolog. Right? There's a more serious problem, as I try to tell everyone. Myriad genetic stock went down for a bit, but then soared back. A, because capitalism is bizarre and strange and bullshit. Uh, B, because they actually own all of the data on all of the mutations, and they have a data bank. So the two genes I speak, I'm speaking about, BRCA1 and 2, are huge. They are humongous genes with many different mutation possibilities. And whether or not, which ones are carcinogenic, which ones are not, that takes a while to figure out. No scientist outside of myriad genetics has access to that data bank. This is an example of genetic information being abused. This is ownership of knowledge. People are dying of breast cancer, right? And they do not release their information. It's, it's, it's a, it, it is data, data, a big data uh, business, uh, proprietary data bank. So if you think that's strange, this is the second part of it, which is shorter, fear not. This is a land of the United States is falling off the deep end, not just because we, you know, of the president. DNA testing companies and ownership. Um, we have in the United States, which you don't have in Europe, uh, direct to consumer advertising, particularly by the pharmaceutical industry in the United States. We're not the only ones. We're the third one uh, behind Hong Kong and New Zealand. Brazil adapted it with limitations. That you're not allowed to have non-prescription medicines. You only can advertise non-prescription medicines, not prescription. We advertise everything. So when you're watching an American football game and you have erectile dysfunction because you're old, you can take a pill and all of a sudden you have an erection and you can watch the football game. So it's magical. It's always great having Europeans and my guests when they're watching American commercials. So I have for you two commercials by Ancestry DNA. That's one 
one of the major, one of the three major DNA testing companies, 23andMe is also a very important company. Um, and now there's a new one, Helix, that's getting started up. This is a funny commercial, but think about notions of identity and biology. Growing up, we were German. We danced in a German dance group. I wore lederhosen. When I first got on Ancestry, I was really surprised that I wasn't finding all of these Germans in my uh, tree. A lot I decided of Germans to have trees. my DNA tested through Ancestry DNA. The big surprise was we're, we're not German at all. 52% of my DNA comes from Scotland and Ireland. So I traded in my lederhosen for a kilt. Ancestry has many paths to discovering your story. Get started for free at Ancestry.com. Yeah, and then you're going to pay shortly thereafter. Now, that's funny. It's amusing Scottish-German. The next one is fascinating and almost deeply disturbing. Dear foremothers, your society was led by a woman who governed thousands, commanded armies, yielded to no one. When I found you in my DNA, I learned where my strength comes from. My name is Courtney McKinney. And this is my Ancestry DNA story. Now, with two times more geographic detail than other DNA tests, order your kit at AncestryDNA.com. That's powerful marketing. It's very powerful marketing. And to sit there and say, my strength comes from my DNA as someone who studied molecular biology and someone who knows German history, well, I don't think I want to make that statement. The fascinating thing, I give this talk, Auf Deutsch in Germany. When the Germans see those commercials, they are deeply disturbed for obvious reasons. I mean, they're just shocked. You're not allowed to do that in Germany. You're not allowed to uh, try to guess someone's ancestry by his or her DNA. It's illegal. They don't have 23andMe or Ancestry Ancestry DNA. Germans who want to do this have to send their sample to the United States or Britain, and then they get the example back. In a court of law, you're not allowed to use Ancestry based on DNA because of because of the third Reich in Germany. So this is a story about race and genomics during the early 21st century. It was in the year 2000, the Human Genome Project was the project that sequenced 3 times 10 to the 9th base pairs for 3 times 10 to the 9 dollars. It was a sale, $1 per base pair. Um, And around 2000, it was winding down. It wasn't yet completed. And they determined that between all humans on the Earth, there's a 99.9% similarity at the level of DNA. It turns out it's slightly greater. It's about 99.7% similarity. And J. Craig Venter, who was one of the major players of the Human Genome Project, said, well, look, the moral to the story is that there's only one race. It's the human race. As the Human Genome Project was winding down, we decided to enter into what's called the haplotype, or hapmap story. And that was funded by numerous governments as well as big pharma companies simultaneously. And they're saying, hold on, that small percentage of difference between each human being is important for two reasons. One, medically. You might have a certain DNA, you might have a cytosine, I might have an adenine, and that explains why I respond to a particular drug, but you do not. Big Pharma needs to know that. Big Pharma spends a lot of money trying to tailor drugs to individuals so that popu- population, so that populations will respond. It's the rise of precision medicine, right? It's very, very important. The other bit is the historically very interesting bit. The differences in DNA can tell us something about human migration over tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And there's a great Max Planck Institute, the Science of Human History in Jena, that does just that. DNA is an archive. If you know how to read it, if you have molecular biologists, they can show you how populations have descended from one another over time. It's a very powerful tool. The question, though, is do you define those biological differences as being racial? Indeed, what the hell is a race? And my favorite question when someone says that is, well, how many of them are there? That always gets people, you know, stopping and thinking. Because there are numerous ways to categorize human difference. It doesn't have to be racial, however one defines race. It could be based on local adaptation, geographic ancestry. The classic example I tell my student is sickle cell anemia. The sickle cell anemia disease was discovered in the United States in 1910, and it was only uh, um, only seen in African Americans. It was called the black the, the black disease in the United States, so it was seen as being racial. As time went on, we realized that people in Sicily could suffer from sickle cell anemia, people in Greece, people in India, people around. It gives you, if you're, if you're, if you're homozygote, you're going to die. Uh, now modern medicine, you can live. But if you're heterozygous, it gives you immunity to malaria. So it's not a racial disease. It's a, local, it's a, it's a, it's a global adaptation you know, gene, right? 
Sociologists and cultural anthropologists fight biologists all saying, look, this notion of race, no such animal, at the, pun intended, at the, at the level of DNA. What do molecular biologists think? There's a debate. Most molecular biologists with whom I've spoken, and a lot of them, at a place like Caltech, a place like MIT and Harvard, and they basically say, we really don't believe in, most of them do not believe in the notion of race. I'd say, I have never done an official say, maybe 90%. Many of them also say, we don't want to talk about race because we don't want to be labeled as racists. They also say, for us, words like population do much more work because race is so vague, and we can define the population as we want to define them. But there have been a number of leading bio, molecular biologists and molecular geneticists who have supported a molecular biology of race. One was Neil Reich, who was at Stanford when he wrote this article in Nature. He's now at UCSF. And he says, look, molecular biologists need to embrace the diversity of races since, quote, ignoring our differences, even with the best intentions, will ultimately lead to the disservice of those who are in the minority, unquote. Races are not biologically meaningless. Risk for disease is not homogeneous through all populations. So he's basically saying, if you ignore race, you're being racist, right? Not outwardly, but by you ignoring the population, by not including those populations, you're continuing a racist trend. The self-described Hispanic um, uh, American, Esteban Gonzalez Boychat, also from UCSF, says, look, the problem we have here is that anytime we do research on medicine, we go to uh, 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 clinics where they have tissue or biomolecules deposited, a vast majority of the people who donate their biological materials are white European, mostly men, some women. African Americans generally don't, Native Americans generally don't, African Americans generally don't because they've had a really rough time with being exploited, as we talk about, by the government who's used their tissues for anything but helping them medically. So that he's basically saying, unless we keep an eye out for race, the white male will stay the, the symbol of medicine, right? So there's a liberal argument to argue for race in the United States to say that the white male may no longer be the symbol of medicine, we must include women and people of color, right? It's an interesting argument. Most recently, the very good Harvard geneticist, David, uh, I presume he said Reich, I don't think he says Reich, David Reich, wrote a book that was highly controversial, also had an op-ed in the New York Times in March, who we are and how we got here, which was basically to say, look, we need to take the notion of race very seriously. We need to be precise about it, but to ignore race totally would be to miss an important medical intervention. Now, why privilege race? And this is the great work that I'm stealing. Of Stephen Epstein has a great book called Inclusion from the University of Chicago Press. And what, so basically, the argument is this, it's not that the scientists are a bunch of racist idiots, right? It's not that at all. Um, Basically, it's about the Americans coming to terms with their past. We were really great at eugenics, right? We sterilized over 60,000 people in the United States, most of them people of color, nearly all of them from lower socioeconomic uh, incomes because we didn't want them to propagate, right? Um, it was horrific. You might not, might not know about Tuskegee. Tuskegee was an experiment on African-American sharecroppers in Tuskegee, Alabama. From 1933 to 1993, over 600 African-American men were not treated for syphilis so that we could know what the long-term effects of syphilis on the human body were. We yelled at the Nazis for doing that to rabbits. No joke. Why We thought that was unethical. So clearly, that was a problem. Most, more recently, the HIV-AIDS epidemic, which in the United States was usurped by wealthy gay white, man, white men who excluded, they weren't interested in women who were HIV positive or AIDS positive, and they weren't interested in people of color who were marginalized. As a result, you have tag, act up, splintering groups politically in the HIV epidemic in the United States. So basically what happens is that the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, say, mea culpa, right? Physicians played a critical role in all of this, in eugenics, because there were, there were doc, that we had sterilization boards in the United, United States as late as 1983. I mean, I was, you know, I, I was nine years old then, right? Uh, there are doctors who are alive who are sterilized. There are people who are sterilized who are still alive in the United States. Um, Tuskegee clearly also, uh, doctors not knowing exactly that they were treating the, the African Americans with either placebos or purposely limiting the, the treatment. So they, the NIH public 
passes the this Congress passes the NIH Revitalization Act, which says if you researchers get money from us, the National Institutes of Health, they have a huge budget in the United States. I think it's now 37 billion dollars a year. It's very, you know, they're very powerful, grant, they have a lot of money. Um, white males are not the universal symbol of medicine anymore. You need, if you're doing diagnostics or therapeutics, you need to include data on women and people of color, and women of color. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive categories, right? Similarly, the Food and Drug Administration said, if you want to get your new drug approved by us, we want to see trials of efficacy and safety on women and people of color. If you do not, we will not give you a patent. So again, it's about inclusion. Now, what was Big Pharma's response? This was great, because we can, we, historians have now detailed this. At first, they balked and said that this was socialism. Because Big Pharma clearly has read the Manifesto and Die Grundrisse uh, Deutsche Ideologie, so they know Marx really well. Not. They basically said this is state interference into private interest. This is horrible. Within six months, they changed their tune and embraced this, because they realized race creates markets and powerful markets in the United States. And with that, in 2005, you have the first drug, Bidil, which was approved for African Americans who suffer from a heart attack. Subsequently, there's Amaryl, which is a drug that is to treat uh, Hispanic Americans, although that's no longer a race, that's now an ethnicity, according to the US Census, it's confusing, who suffer from type 2 diabetes, right? So what is Big Pharma saying? Big Pharma is saying, you know, the government's right. One size doesn't fit all, and that's true. They've known that for years. One drug is not going to is not going to cure every one of the same disease. On the other hand, they're not going to tailor medicine for each one of us. We're too poor, and you know, they're not interested, right? But so you want some number less than the total popula population of the Earth, some number greater than one, and it's a biological category in the United States, race. It's a phenomenally powerful marketing. We see how they market drugs according to race. So it is race-based medicine. The interesting question is now, all of a sudden people realize that the race-based hope medicine of the 2000s haven't come to fruition. We're not nearly as different biologically as we thought. Bido, by the way, will work for Caucasian Americans and Native Americans and Asian Americans just as well as it does for African Americans. They didn't do the control well enough, but it didn't really matter because it stopped the drug from becoming a um, generic. If you can find that your drug is race-based, you can renew your patent for another 16 years in the United States. It's amazing. I should have been intellectual property. I could have been rich. I would have sold my soul to the devil, but I already have, right? So some people argue that we're still in the age of race-based medicine. Approximately one-fifth of the new drugs in the past six years demonstrated differences in response across, notice, racial stroke ethnic groups. They use race and ethnicity interchangeably in the sciences because they get worried about, you know, they want to be, you know, they're like, okay, we'll say both just to, Sociology and cultural anthropology have a fit, but the biologists, ah, racial, ethnic, what the heck, same thing. Um, the editor of the American Journal of, the, of Pharmaceutical Bulletin says, look, we might, be race bait, we might be shifting more to precision medicine in which race does not play such an important role. But the problem is race is seen as being so importantly phenotypic. What are we going to use if we don't use race for a difference for human populations? So I'm just fascinated as an historian of the various forces coming together in the late 20th century with very different political agendas on precision of personalized medicine. The NIH and FDA patient advocacy groups, I think they have the heart on the side of the angels. They want to be inclusive. They want to give rights to their patients. Big Pharma, I don't think they have the heart on the side of the angels. It's a marketing ploy. Personal genomics companies, DNA companies, I don't think they have the heart on the side of the angels either. How do DNA test companies do it? They take 600 to 700,000 DNA markers uh, around the populations in the continents, Asia, the Americas, Africa, and Europe. And they look for these things called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. polymorphisms. You, again, you might have, sight, have a guanine, I might have an adenine. And if, my, if I pass my adenine on to my children and so on in my population, the SNP becomes an aim. I love molecular biology because all words are abbreviated. So when you go into a laboratory, it's like they're speaking another language. So they're interested in ancestry informative markers to determine one's ancestry. So 23andMe invented a new chip just in last December called the V5. Um, it takes 650,000 SMPs from the X and Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA, which you get from your mom, right? And it writes, it's innovative machine learning technology under the hood gets better and more precise as we add new customers and refine our technology. 
Welcome to the age of bioinformatics and big data in molecular biology. Ancestry DNA, another genetics company, tests for about 700,000 SMPs from the autosomal, i.e. non-sex chromosomes, and they compare their clients' DNA with those original 600 to 700,000 markers, and you can do these tests from between $50 and $199. Their data banks are proprietary. That's important. The techniques they use, the algorithms they use, Lord knows I've tried to go undercover, but I, you know, I stand out. They know I can figure this crap out. They do not divulge. Um, but I wanted you to think a bit about the relationship between genotype, which is what your DNA is, and phenotype, what you look like, because that's far more complex than you may think. This is what I'm about to say, a true story. An individual sends his or her, his or her epithelial cells, your cheek cells, sends it to 23andMe, he or she gets the results back several months later. If it's a, good, if it's a quick turnout, it gets six weeks later. 50% of his or her DNA markers are Irish in origin, from the, uh, descended from the, uh, the Nile of Nine hostages, a fourth century Irish warlord. There really is such a warlord. I'm not making that up. With three million descendants worldwide, we've been told. So talk about dominant genes. He's pretty good. What do you think this individual, not the Nile of Nine hostages, but the individual that submitted his or her DNA looks like? Look like that? Does she look like that? Do we have Liam the leprechaun look like that? The answer is Skip Gates, right? Who famously supports the biology of race, like the biology of race. He owns part of AfricanAncestry.com where African Americans are encouraged to submit their DNA to, t to tell stories about migrations with slavery to the United States. Um, he had Faces of America at PBS in 2010 where he invited Yo-Yo Ma, Meryl Streep, who had their DNA, and they would, they would then, they, he'd tell them on camera. Yo-Yo Ma was so moved that he was descended from a, 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 lord, a warlord in China that he played his cello. Anytime you get Yo-Yo Ma to play your cello for free, it's a good day. And then 2014, he had Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates, Jr., which had prominent African-American scholars with Ancestry, AfricanAncestry.com doing the testing. Now, what about DNA companies and the, the knowledge that they get from your DNA when you do these tests? The chief source of capital is not you paying for these tests. They're fairly relatively cheap, $50 to $199, right? They sell your genetic information to big pharma and to insurance companies in the United States, right? They're not allowed... It's aggregate data. They're not allowed to give your name with it. That would go against uh, the law in the United States. Um, but they sell it. Uh, that's why I always tell people, if you have relatives in the U.S. that want to do this crap, don't do this crap, right? Read the terms of service, the, the terms of condition, be, before you submit the material. You can opt out of having your data used, and you should. So the question is, who owns your genetic information? What is ownership? There's a great book by... Uh, Proudhon, what is ownership and what is, proper, what is property, sorry, in 1840 that influenced a young guy by the name of Karl Marx on theories of, of, of property. Your actual DNA, the double helical material structure, that's yours. No one's going to claim that. It would never hold up in a court of law. Uh, the information coded by that sequence, however, it's a bu is theirs because you give them the right to use that information. So property and, is, is, and ownership is a bundle. So you still have your DNA, you can still use it, they're not going to charge you to use it, but they have the right to use the information by selling it to genetic, inf selling it to big pharma. Um, 23 and Me's terms of service, you specifically understand you will not receive any compensation for any research or commercial products. You might have a great gene that's very important, that can be used as a stem cell, you're not going to receive any money from this. There's a very sad example called, from Henrietta Lacks, for those who ever did molecular biology, called HeLa cells. Henrietta Lacks was an African-American woman who died of cervical cancer. Her cell line became the most important cell line in the history of molecular biology. She and her family received zero dollars and zero cents from that cell line. It's used worldwide, right? Worldwide cell line. 23andMe may also include your information and aggregated genetic self-reported information to disclose, uh, disclose to third-party nonprofit and or commercial research partners. Again, you can opt out. The CEO of 23andMe has been very honest, and she says they do not work with insurance companies, and that's true as far as we can tell. However, if you are asked by an insurance company whether you have learned genetic information about, about health conditions and you do not disclose this to them, they may be considered to be fraud. So in other words, if you had a DNA test and you know the results, an insurance company has the right to ask you, have you ever had a genetic information test? 
And if you lie, that is fraud. Now, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act says that you're not, they're not allowed to ask, ask you about information genetic tests if it's health insurance. But if it's life insurance, long-term disability insurance, um, uh, uh, disability or long-term care insurance, they may legally use genetic information against you. And, and, and they can de deny, your, uh, deny an insurance uh, policy in the United States. Ancestry.com, this is my favorite, warns its customers that their DNA be, may be used against them or a genetic relative in a court of law. This has already happened four times in the United States since April of 2018. I'm not making this up. The most famous case is the Golden State Killer. The case went cold in the 1970s. He raped, I think, 100 people. He killed over two score, uh, sorry, two, uh, two, uh, 20, yeah, a score of people. Um, they had DNA, the, the case had gone cold. He had actually worked for the police for a while. The case had gone cold for decades. Uh, a third cousin, we think it was a third cousin, decided to do a DNA test. It went into a public genetic information bank. Someone decided to reopen the case, said, you know, let's just see if the DNA we have on the, on the, on the Golden State Killer uh, matches any sample. And it did. And they were able to convict him because his third cousin decided to give a test. So I always say that at Thanksgiving, which is a family, you know, family dinner time in the United States, if you're in the United States or if you have cousins or friends in the United States, make sure the next Thanksgiving, if they're going to do this test, make sure they ask around the table, did any of you commit a crime that we need to know about because I'm going to get my DNA tested. Uh, so notions of privacy are fascinating here. And if you think that's disturbing, consider the article that came out about six weeks ago, I mean seven weeks ago, in the New York Times. It was by Heather Murphy, your DNA identified by DNA of others. Already, 60% of Americans of Northern European descent, the primary group using these sites, because we fetishize about ancestry for reasons I personally don't realize, can be identified through databases whether or not they've joined one themselves. Researchers say it will soon be possible, I say within two to three years, to identify up to 90% of white Americans from genealogical databases. Wow. That's fascinating. You're not, a, even though the data is aggregate and anonymous, you're not as anonymous as you may think you may be. Because after all, DNA can identify you rather precisely in ways that even fingerprints, more precisely than fingerprints can, right? So what's the conclusion? As a historian, I'm, I'm, I think we're always obliged to discuss the unequal power relations in, 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 in the situations we, we investigate and the actors that we, we study in order to illustrate the politics of ownership and property and privacy. Not to do that, I think, would be immoral. Indeed, I'd say criminal. So my argument was when I was writing these depositions and amicus curiae brief is to say profiting from patenting objects is not inevitable. People from myriad genetics, of course we want to patent this stuff. How else are we going to make money? Because it's inevitable that if you patent something, you make money. You have to patent the object. And that's where Miles, the German historian, came in, because that's not true. We flash back to the year 1905. Einstein writes three great papers, which is irrelevant to this talk. 90% of the pharmaceutical industry is dominated by the Germans. 90%. It is illegal until the 1930s to patent drugs or any chemical in Germany. You patent processes. That encourages innovation. You don't patent the drug, because they argue, if you patent the drug, that would be immoral. You could control the cost. Go figure. So this is a classic example how, historically, you don't have to pat patent the thing. You can patent a process, still make a ton of money. German pharmaceutical companies, again, were not starving as a result of this. And we go back to Judge Learned Hand's adrenaline patent. He allowed adrenaline to be patented because he wanted to help the American pharmaceutical company. Because the Americans were pissed off that the Germans were dominating everything. Right? The Americans, the Germans had really good organic chemists until 1933. And so they specialized in creating synthetic pathways for making drugs. The Americans didn't have that knowledge. The, the Anglo-American world was very good at taking a natural substance and distilling it in order to give it medicinal properties such as adrenaline. So Learned Hand said, the adrenaline patent stands because I want to help the American pharmaceutical industry to at least get some strength against the Germans. The fact that they use his adrenaline patent to back up the pernicious activities of myriad genetics is really scandalous because his claim to fame in legal circles is his antitrust law. He was very much opposed 
to patents that gave a ridiculous monopoly. He would have been absolutely opposed to gene patentings had he been alive to see it. Commercial interests were not always a part of genetics. The famous Drosophilus, Morgan at Caltech, uh, Storvidson, Bridges, Muller, Dobjansky, Beetle, the Caltech, Columbia uh, role of genetics in the 20s and 30s, very anti-commercial. Anyone try to commercialize, they're kicked out of the group. They shared information with each other. They called it the moral economy of knowledge sharing. So, and they were phenomenally influential. They are, I mean, for any of, I'm old, so when I took genetics exams, we had to do map units. They invented map units and the classical genetics. And similarly, race does not need to be the proxy for human biological difference. That is not inevitable, right? We do it for important historical reasons in the United States, but it doesn't have to be the case. And that's why, I mean, interesting, the, the stuff that we talked about this morning, it's an interesting, although not unique, historical moment. This is a story about identity based on biology, not based on culture, right? It's based on phenotypic, in a sense, biology. So to end, I think we're always morally obliged to show that there always have been, there are now, and I'm willing to bet there always will be, alternatives, and that we're required to show why certain alternatives were discarded for political, socioeconomic, philosophical, scientific reasons, right? That's what the historian can do in order to show how it is we got here is not inevitable. It's not natural. Walter Benjamin got this very right back in the 1920s and 1930s in Germany. And I always say, waiting until closure is reached really disallows us from playing a role. We can bring certain skills to the table in a controversy. If we wait till it's settled, we don't have any input. And I think our input is important, precisely the, the, the notion of alternatives. And precisely because much is at stake, I think we need to be at that table. So I'll answer questions here, but in case something occurs to you, there's my email or address. You can always feel free to email me or text me. Thank you so much for your time.